Hey, everybody, welcome to period four, the market revolution, lesson four five. This is going to be an economics heavy unit this time around. And by the end of this lesson, you will be able to explain the causes and the effects of the innovations in technology, agriculture and commerce over time. So to begin, we need to talk about changing commerce or the practice of buying or selling goods in the United States. In the colonial era and the new nation era, goods were made by skilled craftsmen called artisans, um, individuals who had trained their whole lifetime in a particular field to make goods. Those artisans um, made goods in their workshops or shops for short, which are often located below their home. So second floor you lived, first floor you worked. And in artisan shops, customers could come in and let's say they want a men's dress shirt. The tailor, who was the craftsman, would measure that individual custom and then sew a shirt specifically for them. So each piece was handcrafted for the customer who purchased it. That meant goods made in shops were slow to be made, tailors can only sew so much at a time, and much more expensive because they were handcrafted for each person. So only the elite really purchased items from artisans and in shops. Most working class people, most small farmers made their own stuff at home. They made their own candles. They made their own furniture. They made their own clothing. They couldn't afford the higher priced items. However, starting in 1800, the United States undergoes a revolution in economics. It's called the market revolution. And we see artisans working in shops replaced with goods made in factories and sold in stores. And so what factories did was instead of everybody working at home all over the place, it brought all the workers under one roof where they worked together to manufacture goods, which meant, which meant that goods could be produced much more quickly than they could by artisans. Those goods would then be sold in stores um, where customers could go in and purchase them. And because the goods were made on such a large volume, the stores could sell them much cheaper than custom made goods that were sold in shops. Stores, of course, call, stores were called stores because they could store extra goods for when customers came in. Shops didn't have that because everything was custom made. So the market revolution is going to have two impacts on the United States. One, it's going to create a new series of entrepreneurs called middlemen who buy goods made from manufacturers and sell them into consumers in the store. So your, your storekeepers, your retail people, those are your middlemen. They're buying the shirts and they're selling them to the customers. The other thing that changes is because goods are produced so fast, so quickly and so cheaply, they're no longer custom made. So when a working class person walked into a store and said, I want a shirt, they just went over to the stack of shirts and said, are you a small, medium or large? Take the one that best fits you. It's a lot cheaper than a custom made, handmade piece by an artisan. So there were some technological changes that caused this market revolution to take place. First was the steam engine. The steam engine um, allowed you to heat water to create steam and then steam turns turbines or gears or, or makes something happen. Steam engines were essential because they replaced human power, which gets fatigued. We all know that. Um, Go for a run or, or lift weights, you're tired. So what a steam engine does is it replaces that human power with mechanical power, which can run pretty much 24 hours a day. Um, the problem with steam engines, though, was that they were initially individually made. So if your what's a knot on your steam engine broke, snapped, then you had to replace the entire steam engine because all the parts were made explicitly for that steam engine and they didn't work with each other. However, that was problem was addressed by a guy named Eli Whitney, who said, well, this is stupid. Let's make machines to make machine parts. And those became interchangeable parts. So in Whitney's factory, machine, people running machines were churning out identical what's it, not it's. So if it broke on your steam engine, you would just go to the store, buy a new what's it, not it, and put it on the steam engine and it'd be up and running again. So interchangeable parts allowed mechanization to happen at a rapid pace because replacing a machine was no longer costly and expensive. 
Third invention was the cotton gin. I bet your ears perked up when I said Eli Whitney, because everybody in America knows he invented the cotton gin. People generally don't know what it is or why he did it, though. So when you grow cotton, cotton is a fiber. Um, and it comes from a plant. So you pick the head of the plant off and inside this little pod are white, sticky, stringy fibers. And in those are seeds because it's a plant. So what you need to do to make cotton into thread is take a metal comb and comb through the fiber to get all the seeds out so the fiber can then be spun into threads. If you have seeds in there, your thread won't work. It'll, it, it will be bumpy and lumpy. And that was usually done by enslaved people by hand. And you would need dozens of slaves combing the cotton that was brought in from the field so it could be sold. Whitney said, this is ridiculous. Um, personally, he was not an advocate of slavery. And he said, I can invent a machine that can do the work of dozens of slaves by one person and greatly reduce the number of slaves in the United States. And that machine was the cotton gin. And it allowed one person to crank a hand handle and feed cotton into a machine where the metal combs turned and pulled out the seeds. It led for an explosion in cotton production in the United States. Unfortunately, Whitney's goal of reducing slavery, the opposite happened because the planters said, well, now I only need one person to run the cotton gin. I can send the other 11 slaves out to the fields to grow more cotton. It was all about the wealth that the planters could accrue. So you may ask yourself, what's the big deal with cotton? Well, it was turned into textiles. Textiles is a fancy name for fabric. You take the cotton threads, weave them together in a device called a loom, which weaves threads together that makes a single sheet of fabric, which can be then cut and sewn into garments. Um, if you think of textiles this way, if you have a shirt or a pair of pants and it gets snagged and ripped, if you look at the rip, you see the little threads. That's because the, the tear has undone the work that the loom has done weaving those threads together. Looms required steam engines to operate. Um, they used to be done by hand and, and people would self-loom, but with the advent of the steam engine, a mechanical loom was invented that went much faster. Um, the loom required a water supply to run because steam requires water. So that meant that most of the textile factories were found in the New England region, which is more rocky and mountainous, and that there are more rivers and streams. You didn't see textile factories in the South. They had to be dependent upon a water supply. Finally, the invention of the telegraph, which was text messaging for its day. The telegraph allowed instantaneous communication across great distances using electricity and electrical impulses. <clears throat> And somebody at one spot would push down on a little divot, doot, 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 and across the country, an electrical impulse would travel. And on the other machine, the little divot would go doot, 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 in the same pattern. So it allowed people to communicate, business people to place orders. Eventually, the telegraph will even connect America and Europe for instantaneous con conversation. Communication is the word I was looking for. Okay, so we've got the technological innovations out of the way. We've got the market revolution out of the way. Now we're going to see a construction boom in the United States that takes place for internal improvements. And if you remember Henry Clay's American system, that's a fancy way of saying infrastructure are roads and canals. Um, internal improvements were necessary. We needed new roads, we needed canals, which are man-made rivers to move goods from factories to consumers or to move raw materials to factories to make goods. We had to connect the country economically. The question came up is who's gonna pay for all this construction? Um, is it going to be state because the roads are in the state? Is it going to be federal because the roads connect together and then they cross state lines? Who has the power and responsibility and right to pay for this? Well, the federal government said, well, we do. And Henry Clay's American system created legislative funding for the construction of roads and canals by the national government. And the Supreme Court upheld the right of the national government to regulate interstate commerce, very important word. Prefix inter means between states. So if 
the roads are being built or the canals are being built to move goods from one state to another, federal government can pay for it. So what that meant was some internal improvements were paid by the state, some were paid by the national. The national road was the first man-made route to connect the eastern United States in Virginia to the western United States in Illinois. That was federally funded because it crossed state lines. The Erie Canal was the largest canal in the United States connecting the Great Lakes to the St. Lawrence Seaway, which led to the Atlantic Ocean. And the Erie Canal was entirely within New York State, so the New York State government paid for that because it created a boom in commerce and made New York City the financial hub of this country. So once the infrastructure was built, people began to say, well, wait a minute, a lot of this federal spending, this national spending is occurring on roads and canals going west to east. Is that fair? Um, the answer is, well, it's necessary because there's not many rivers that go west to east in the United States. They're primarily north to south, and a lot of the roads had to traverse the Appalachian Mountains, which required intense and expensive construction. The north-south trade did not need as much infrastructure because there are already existing rivers um, and coastlines to move cotton up north and northern products down south. But southerners felt like, well, wait a minute, you're taxing me to pay to build all these roads in a part of the country that doesn't affect me. Republicans in the south cried foul, and they said this was abuse of federal power. What they did not see was the market revolution created an interconnected national economy. The South grew cotton, which went to northern textile factories and bought northern manufactured goods. The West fed the rest of the country with corn and wheat and barley. They fed the North and they fed the South. They bought the textiles made in northern factories from southern cotton. And the Northeast was fed by the West and fed, metaphorically, by the cotton fields of the South to produce its textiles. So what the market revolution did was it united the country in an economic web where each region benefited from the economics of the other. And it proved Henry Clay's American system to be correct. That's all for today, folks. Thank you so much and have a great day.